Thank you. I'm uh, truly humbled. Nobody's ever called me doctor before. So, <laughs> And uh, I was listening to President Hone's speech and I thought, I guess I shouldn't talk about failure is your success or reimagining your life a million times in the future. So I'll speak about other things, um, but I'll start by saying President Hone, Provost Madigan, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty and graduates, it's a true honor for me to be addressing you on this day, to be congratulating you, because this is a place that is so close to my heart, this place that you've earned your master's, a master's and doctorates, because it's where I began my journey in journalism as an undergraduate. It's where I wrote my first stories in the college paper and then in the Boston Globe through, the, through my co-ops. And that newspaper is where I met the mentor of my career, the late Anthony Shadid, a two-time Pulitzer winner for his seminal work on the Iraq War. And he ultimately lost his life in Syria doing what we do, telling stories of the most vulnerable as war consumed their country. He held my hand as I grew into an international correspondent and taught me the value of bearing witness to global shifts and conflicts, bearing witness through the people those wars and power struggles impacted, making sure the human toll of those moments was the story, the stories of societies ripping apart in the face of war, occupation, populist uprisings, and beyond. And now without my co-ops, I wouldn't have met him, and he would not have become my mentor, my friend, or my peer. When I was asked to give this commencement address, I thought to myself, what can I tell you, a class of distinguished academics that represents 81 countries in a world that is so interconnected? What can I offer you as you go out into the world as thought leaders? And my mind went to fear. And I, now bear with me, I know that sounds strange on a day like today, but we live in an age of fear, impending climate change disaster a massive war in Europe that is threatening the global world order, division so deep in this country that it is unclear if American democracy will survive the divide, and a changing labor landscape that is remaking the job market. So why am I talking about fear on such a hopeful day, a day of celebration and excitement? I'm talking about it because for me, it was in moments of fear that I found my path. I understood why I had chosen to be a storyteller, to bear witness, to hold those in power to account. In moments of fear, I found urgency and a clear understanding of why I had chosen to give a platform to those who needed it most. Because yes, fear can be debilitating, but it can also be our greatest motivator for good in this world, even when it feels too hard, too big, too unsolvable. I'll start at the very beginning of my career. I was a fresh graduate from Northeastern, and thanks to my co-ops, I had enough newspaper cl clippings to land an internship and then a job at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in Texas. And I started, as a lot of journalists do, as a night cops reporter covering crime and policing. I wrote about home invasions and violence and corruption and a Krispy Kreme bandit who would leave dozens of glazed don donuts on people's yards. I would say more a saint than a criminal, but anyways. Um, our mid-sized city newspaper was part of a family-owned chain called Knight Ritter. The newspaper chain had a storied Washington bureau known for questioning the false intelligence that ultimately led to the Iraq war nearly 20 years ago. It had international bureaus and an award-winning office in Baghdad reporting on the Iraq war. And so one month into my very first job as a professional journalist, I walked into my boss's office and asked her to send me to Iraq to cover the war. I was nervous, I was afraid, and my boss, she was amused. She looked at me, she laughed a little, and then she told me to get back to my desk. I was too young, I was too inexperienced. But a few months later, she called me back in and asked me if I still wanted to go. And it wasn't long before I was on a plane to Baghdad at 23 years old. I looked out the window as the plane did a corkscrew landing to avoid being struck, and I thought, who thought this was a good idea? I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> I was afraid. On the airport road, I looked out the window to see burned out cars that had been pushed to the sides of the streets. Those cars were made into bombs to attack convoys on this road, a road that I would travel back and forth on often in the years ahead to get to and from the airport, from my Baghdad office and home. But that fear, it didn't stop me. I knew that I could bring a different approach to our reporting in Iraq, infuse it with humanity that is so often missing in reporting on conflict. I told stories of the formation of the Iraqi government. I wrote about families mourning their young children in bombings amid a, se a sectarian civil war that was dividing the nation 
and stealing its children. I wrote about pregnant women trying to schedule their births so they wouldn't be on the road after dark, after curfew. The risks that you might be shot by a US soldier or get caught in an insurgent bombing were much higher for Iraqis traveling at night. I documented killings of Iraqi civilians by the US security group, then called Blackwater. I wrote about young American soldiers fighting a war but not always understanding why. I told a story about the sectarian cleansing of one Baghdad neighborhood from the perspective of the family of the victims, and then I sought out the killer to understand why he was doing this to his own neighborhood, to his own neighbors. And at every turn, I was afraid. Afraid not of the danger, but that I might not be able to capture all that was at stake in a war that proved to be a catalyst for unrest in the region, a war that was a long, expensive, and deadly undertaking by the US government. From there, I moved to Egypt, where I covered uprisings that started in Tunisia, spread to Egypt, and soon throughout the Middle East and North Africa. In those moments, I watched people bravely revolt against autocratic rulers to demand a say in who governs them. But revolt turned to infighting, to confusion, to repression, and in some cases, extreme violence by those in power against those daring to demonstrate. In Egypt, I ran through an alley under fire and into a state massacre of pro-Muslim Brotherhood protesters, not because I'm brave and not because I'm a thrill seeker, quite scared of most things. I did it to count the bodies so that no one could say it did not happen or that they shot themselves as sometimes I was told. In some cases, demonstrators in places like Syria and in Libya took up arms to defend themselves. And as we saw the most extreme, the best armed dominated. The thing that I realized as I watched people trying to survive these moments was that humanity was on display. It could be ugly and cowardly, but it could also be beautiful and brave. For me, it was captured in a lawyer that I met in Benghazi in Eastern Libya in the first days of the revolt against the late Muammar Gaddafi over a decade ago. Her city dared to rebel and it was paying the price. Gaddafi's forces were pounding the east, firing into homes with no thought for civilian life. And during all of this, this lawyer, Selwa Bureres, was trying to keep the social compact we have with each other in the cities where she lives, where she lived. She started a gun collection to take up arms from people after the fight so her city wouldn't be awash with weapons. She encouraged seatbelt use. She tried to grow civil society in a place where it did not exist. And she ultimately was killed, assassinated for her hope for a democratic Libya post-Gaddafi. In the years after the revolt and Gaddafi's ouster and killing, those armed militias became the power brokers of her country. A few weeks before she was slain in 2014, I spoke with her in Tripoli and asked her why she didn't stop. And stop speaking up against extremists with guns in her country. Her son had recently survived an assassination attempt and that attack was meant for her. She told me that she and others still had hope for a new Libya, a better Libya, a Libya they imagined when they chose to rise up. She was killed because she'd gone home to vote despite the risk. That was how important it was to her. Today, others carry on her legacy. And then I covered here, protests demanding that this country see that Black Lives Matter in the face, again, of violence, police violence in many cases. And most recently, I returned from Ukraine, where I watched everyone from a 19-year-old interior designer to an editor-in-chief who typically covers corruption join the territorial defense and take up arms against the Russian forces invading and occupying their country. I talked to women and children flooding across the Polish border with nothing but backpacks and yoga mats to find safety away from their homeland. Fear did not stop them, but many of them had no choice. And they encouraged me to be more brave in covering and telling their stories. And there were many journalists who'd been, who were killed who were trying to do the same thing, not just in Ukraine, but in Syria, in Mexico, in Iraq, and the latest this week, an American journalist killed in the West Bank. We are guided by a desire to shine light. And whenever something seems too hard, I think of Ida B. Wells, a black woman and investigative journalist who spent her life counting and documenting the lynchings of black Americans in this country. The way to right wrong is to turn the light of truth upon them. Those are her words, that rose, the words that drove her vital work. So today, what I say to you, when you think about the future, don't let fear stop you. And I'm not talking about running through alleys under gunfire. I would recommend not doing that. I'm talking about the existential fear, that voice in your head that says you can't, the fear that stops us from trying. Lean into moments that feel scary. When it's hard to speak up, when it's hard to see how you might find your purpose, make your difference as an educator, as a scientist, as a storyteller, as a lawyer, as an engineer, 
Search for that purpose in what scares you. That is where I found my calling. On my graduation day many, many, many years ago, I didn't understand how lucky I was to have gotten my education here at Northeastern. It gave me the skill set to start my journalism career, but it also, most importantly, taught me how to find my first job in the field, how to practically start that career. Did I think it would land me here speaking to you as a host of NPR's flagship morning news show? Never. Did I think I would be able to shine a light on what is hidden and ask for accountability from those in power on a national platform? Never. And here we are. I had the resources, thanks to my parents, and the ability to get a degree. You also found a way to pursue a higher education. You are luckier than most having found a path to graduate and doctorate degrees. You have experience in, in your field, you know the world, you are the world, you are the future. So go out there and be impactful. Be the solution even when it feels terrifying, even when it feels impossible, and sometimes maybe it will be impossible, but at least you tried. Because what we have already done in our lives, that's written, but what we will do, what you will do, those pages of our lives are blank. We get to be the author. Do not let the fear of what has happened, what is happening, stop you from pursuing the hope of what could be. You are that hope. So today, graduates, you are equipped and ready. It's time to go write the rest of your story. Do it thoughtfully, do it purposefully, and never let fear of failure stop you from trying to be the difference. Whatever you choose to do, graduates, be bold. Congratulations and good luck.